slogan from Marvel to be risk everything to achieve anything. This is the story of how cinema's richest universe. These were characters that could become iconic characters. From one of the biggest publishers in comics. DC were the Beatles. Marvel were the Rolling Stones. Started not with a bang, but with a whimper. It was just cheap jack budgets, horrible sets. You're asking me to make a $33 million picture for $1 million. There's nothing more to say. The whole film was pulled back and never released. Stop that! How attempts to adapt their characters to the screen. We couldn't sell Marvel shows. People were afraid of losing their career. Brought them to the brink of destruction. Marvel went into bankruptcy. Before a massive gamble. The next logical step was Marvel starting to make their own movies. My turn. Took them from sitting ducks. No more Mr. Huh. Nice Duck. That's gonna work? Are you sure? To soaring gods. Wow. This is like serious big league stuff. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. They were a dying comic book publisher. Marvel was in dire straits. Under the thumb of an intimidating toy tycoon. Avi Arad had a gun that he might pull at any time. <laughs> Led by a fresh-faced executive. Feige was the guy getting everybody coffee. How on earth 616 did they fight the odds? You were going to make the Avengers before Thor and Captain America had even come out. Oh my god, how are we going to do this? To become Hollywood's hottest studio. Ed Norton is not more important than us. <laughs> an Avenger short. How do you recover from it? And create a cinematic universe. Who's gonna go see the Guardian of the Galaxy? There's a tree, and there's a raccoon, and there's a... Uh, no. <laughs> has it gone too far? <laughs> you don't have to do this, please. This is insane. Like no one had ever seen. They know how to spend money. I don't think I've ever seen more luxurious craft services. But the pressure was on. There's a very ceremonious shredding of your script in front of a couple of lawyers. Knowing that if they fell, <laughs> nobody knew it was going to work. The whole universe would fall with them. These bastards are going to get me killed off. <laughs> on icons unearthed Marvel. It really is the most complicated story in our history. Since the dawn of time, humankind has relied on mythology, legends, heroes to inspire us. They've been painted on stone, chiseled into walls. But as the millennia passed, these ancient texts became less Sanskrit and more Comic Sans. And that's where the true power of mythology lives today. Marvel characters are modern mythology. There's something that, at its core, we can relate to. What kid growing up didn't feel like a mutant? Comics were just a great escape. People calling me names, I was a skinny kid, and I remember to fantasize I would be in these characters. I love the idea that they were just ordinary people that were handed these extraordinary powers, but deep down in their heart and their soul, they were still real people. But the company whose name, perhaps more than any other, stands for superheroes, had its beginnings in the true American tradition of, well, bold-faced capitalism. Marvel Comics started with a man by the name of Martin Goodman. Martin Goodman worked in pulp publishing. That's right, pulpy, high-selling fiction. Or, in other words... Anything that would sell, Martin Goodman would just put out there. Another good seller he put out there? Science fiction. He published a magazine called Marvel Science Stories. But what was a really good seller? You know, there was the success of Superman and Batman. And Martin Goodman didn't own either. And so he concluded, We should come up with our own versions. Began with the Human Torch and this provocative title, Marvel Comics. And perhaps due to its pulpy heritage. The characters were different from the clean-cut 
DC characters in that they had problems. And Martin had solutions and wondered, what if superhero characters got together? something that DC hadn't thought of. It was a matter of months before the first Marvel crossover. And this understandably tense encounter between the water-based Namor the Submariner and the flame-based Human Torch foreshadowed, well, why we're here. This would be kind of a major part of the Marvel story, this interconnected universe. A concept ahead of its time. This was in 1939. A time when heroes were needed more than ever. And one would come in the form of Steve, or otherwise known Captain America. Created by Martin Goodman's employees, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, good old Cap shielded America from withering wartime morale. Captain America, he is there to reflect the best of us. That connection to the heart of the country is what makes Cap great. But it was the amount of comics Captain America sold that was truly great. And soon, Marvel was challenging DC in comic sales. However, within Marvel, an internal war was brewing. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby were moonlighting for DC. Because Martin Goodman refused to pay Kirby and Simon the royalties they were promised, an outraged Martin fired his only two writers. For the time being, they're going to try to struggle along without yours truly. With Simon and Kirby gone, Martin Goodman found himself in desperate need of fresh talent. Enter 19-year-old Stanley Lieber, or otherwise known as Stan Lee. So Stan Lee was related to Martin Goodman, and he came on as a sort of an office boy helper. No longer just a sidekick, office boy got a big promotion. Stan was installed as interim editor, even though he had very little interest in comics. He wanted to become a real writer, and even adopted a pen name at Marvel to hide his involvement. Stan's name was Stanley Lieber, last name Lieber, and then he's changed it down to Stanley. But even still, he stuck around. But instead of overseeing a thriving, morale boosting comic company. After the war, it sort of lost its way, and they, again, just sort of tried anything. Including teen comedy, romance comics, crime comics, war comics. As the years went by, people turned off comics and turned on the newfangled television. It was a really rough time at Marvel. I mean, there was plenty of layoffs. Stan stayed, but that could have been the end of the entire story. Stan Lee was done. He was finished. He had told as many bad stories as he called them. His wife, Joan, said to him, if you're going to leave, at least leave with one story that you're proud of or what you would want to do. But what? It had been 20 years since Jack Kirby had struck gold with Captain America. Stan needed something fantastic. And if not that, then some help. It was around that time in 1959, 20 years after Jack Kirby was shown the door, he came back to Marvel. And from the sounds of it, just in time, too. Jack Kirby said Stan Lee was crying in an office. He was afraid he was losing his job. But very soon, Stan would be wiping away those tears. So the story goes that Martin Goodman was playing golf with one of the executives at DC, and they were having luck with their team book called the Justice League. Which was all of the DC heroes running around. Essentially a muscled up version of the crossover concept that Martin had pioneered decades ago. What Stan Lee decided he wanted to do was take a different angle on the team book. It was a simple idea that would have truly fantastic potential. Stan thought, wouldn't it be interesting if they acted more like a family? And if they didn't get along, and if they didn't just focus on, well, there's a giant starfish that's going to ruin Metropolis. It was a concept that inspired what would become Marvel's first family of superheroes. Thus, in 1961, the Fantastic Four was born. And it clicked. The Fantastic Four was an instant success. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had a blueprint and developed a workflow so efficient. The Marvel method, where Stan would do an outline of the story and then Jack would break the pages down and write dialogue suggestions and, and then Stan would come back in and dialogue them. Jack Kirby, him and Stan, they were sort of the dynamic duo. Jack and Stan's Marvel method soon expanded beyond the Fantastic Four 
leading to an incredible, marvelous array of characters we still know and love today. Hulk, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, Thor, the X-Men, Black Panther, all the movie ones, are just on and on and on and on. It's character development. It's not about superpowers or costumes. Marvel Comics were intended to be a soap opera where a fight broke out. Marvel was always very street level and real. Stan Lee described it as being one DNA strand away from reality. But the biggest character to come out of this frenzy of the Marvel method was your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, perhaps Stan's most relatable superhero of all. The idea of a teenage superhero who is not a sidekick who had real problems. He lived with his aunt, and he couldn't pay the bills, and he wanted to meet girls. Spider-Man helped Marvel finally catch DC in comic book sales by 1972. Yet competition for the top spot remained tight, and DC meant business. DC was always very corporate. DC's offices were like the Mad Men offices. And it was like walking into an accountancy firm. DC were the Beatles. Marvel with the Rolling Stones. Marvel bullpen was like the Wild West. It was a college frat house. There's Jim Owsley on roller skates with an 18-inch afro with a boombox rolling down the hallways with a marker, you know, like drawing on the walls. But was the writing on the wall for Marvel? Because in the next great battle between the two comic titans, DC were up, up, and away, and Marvel was only on the ground floor. In 1968, Marvel Comics founder Martin Goodman wound down and cashed up. Marvel was sold to the Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation. That's not hyperbole. It was literally called the Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation. A conglomerate out of New Jersey. Perfect Films? This must have sounded perfect to Stan. Minus the chemical bit. As early as 1969, Stan Lee was starting to talk about chasing Hollywood success. But Stan's new bosses were barely even interested in the comic books they just bought, let alone perfect comic book films. It was more of like an industrial conglomerate that didn't pay too much attention to the comic books. One of its trademark items was like children's vitamins. The Marvel ownership was not really interested in putting in the money to go chasing after Hollywood. Striving less for big screen perfection and instead focusing on small screen mediocrity. You know, we just saw this slew of made for TV stuff. You know, Captain America on a shoestring budget in some Romanian countryside. Oh, come in, Doctor Strange. And unfortunately, things only got stranger. Doctor Strange had a movie that came out in the 70s. It was a made-for-TV film. Stephen Strange, you are the one who was chosen. Doctor Strange, there's this mysticism against a witch. It's not very faithful. I felt tremendous pain. The tremendous pain was all Marvel's. Even their children's TV shows, such as Hanna-Barbera's The Thing, struggled to make an impression. We couldn't get Spider-Man, so we did a series based on The Thing, but it wasn't very successful. Boy, I can't believe my own baby blues. But finally, in 1977, Marvel would be on the big screen. Hey, look, it's that Spider-Man. Well, in Scotland, anyway. The TV show was actually shown as a big movie in Scotland, like a big summer event movie. I thought Steven Spielberg directed it. He definitely didn't. In fact, the short-lived Amazing Spider-Man series was firmly stuck on TVs everywhere else. It's ironic that television back then was considered small potatoes, and that's where Marvel got its start, and they were working towards getting to films because most of the money was in movies. Exactly, because in 1978, DC's most popular superhero was the first to fly off the page and onto the big screen. It's Superman. 1978 Superman was a milestone in superhero filmmaking. Here was a superhero movie for adults. You look at it and you go, this is how you take a comic and make it into a movie. It's not that easy. To make movies, you really need to be in Hollywood. And Marvel wasn't. And so finally, after having worked in New York for 42 years with Marvel, Stan Lee moved to Tinseltown. 
and with the backing of Marvel ownership, started assembling a crack team of Hollywood experts. I was offered the job of president and CEO of Marvel Productions, which was the film division of Marvel Comics. I, quite frankly, was astonished that they called me and offered me the job because I was at Hanna-Barbera and had done the thing, which I don't think they'll ever forgive us for. Stan had only one rule for Margaret, and it was all she needed to know. He said, Maggie, he always called me Maggie, I'll work for you any day of the week as long as you follow my one rule. Don't you ever ask to eat any of my dessert. <laughs> uh, well, apart from that challenge, Margaret had one very simple mission. The expectation, get Marvel Comics out there. And one very complicated problem. The networks were not interested. Because even though they had just dozens and dozens and dozens of characters to exploit, there was a sentiment that Marvel comics would not make good TV shows. But here's the thing, uh, not that thing. Margaret's expertise was in animation. And with her help, Marvel Productions carved out a niche, bringing toys to life, creating classic animated cartoons. Marvel Productions had just gotten the rights with Hasbro to produce Transformers and G.I. Joe. And then we did Jim and we did other series after that. We eventually became on fire because Transformers was so successful. G.I. Joe was so successful. But as for their big screen ambitions, none of Marvel's characters, Hulk, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, Thor, the X-Men, were even coming close. It got to a point where Marvel was so desperate to see their characters up on the big screen, they started selling the rights to not just their little side characters from romance comics, like they sold rights to Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and Captain America as well. In fact, the filming rights to the Fantastic Four traded for just $250,000 to a German producer, Baron Dykinger. So we'll see what happens there. The frustration from our perspective was they weren't really making the movies and yet we were blocked from doing anything because they had the rights. Marvel's situation was far from perfect, and soon they'd be far from the perfect film and chemical company, because Marvel was once again sold, this time to New World Pictures, which had been established and owned by this gentleman, the filmmaking icon, Roger Corman. However, he'd sold New World to some entertainment lawyers, who, if nothing else, probably knew how to read fine print. New World Pictures, was really excited that they bought the rights to Superman. And someone had to say, well, no, actually, Spider-Man is Marvel. But it was the direction they wanted to take Marvel in that would cause the most damage. So New World had this concept that they would only do work that we owned or controlled. And thanks to its fire sale years earlier. They sold rights to Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and Captain America. That left Marvel with few options. We started really struggling as a company. We downsized, meaning we had to cut a lot of talent loose, which was very discouraging. But there was one Marvel property Margaret could still devote herself to putting on the map, and X marked the spot. We had been trying to sell X-Men for years. I had been so determined to sell it. I was like a dog with a bone. I said, look, maybe if we do a pilot, people will understand X-Men. For a cash-strapped Marvel, even a cheap pilot was going to be a stretch. We couldn't afford the budget it would probably really take to do a great job. The answer was to rob Peter to pay Paul, or in this case, rob RoboCop to pay for the X-Men. We had ordered 13 half hours of RoboCop, but we decided to do one less episode of RoboCop and make a pilot for X-Men. Margaret knew X-Men would be a hit. Kind of my final last ditch effort to try to sell X-Men, and it didn't work. Quite frankly, after that, Stan and I gave up. Now I can never make it up to him. Margaret and Stan were in desperate need of some luck. Uh, and if not luck, then... I know! Howard the Duck. What could possibly go wrong? In 1986, Stan and Margaret's dream of seeing a Marvel character on the silver screen became a reality. At last, Marvel was in the game to compete with DC at the box office, but it wasn't one that anyone expected. 
Howard the Duck, the horny alien duck. Of course, the ill-tempered alien duck trapped on Earth. Of all of Marvel's characters. It was a character Marvel still retained the rights to. Howard the Duck had one super fan named George Lucas, and everyone was a fan of him, especially Universal Pictures and their very large checkbook. A collector told me that George Lucas owns an original page of Howard the Duck comic book art. He was from another place, another time, another planet, but he had his own take on things, and I think that's what made it appealing and made it funny. But for a movie version of Howard the Duck to be funny... I knew there was gonna have to be, you know, puppets and, and you know, little people. I was very dubious about that whole little person in a duck outfit and proposed that it could be done cinematically with tables and stuff like that. You know, that idea was shit can. The schedule would never permit anything like that. George went to Phil Tippett. He said, Phil, what are we going to do about this? Phil said, well, you need somebody like that guy, that Tim, Tim, was it? Tim Rose. Well, where's Tim Rose? Well, he's in England. Well, get him over here. <laughs> Having impressed his Admiral Akbar in Return of the Jedi, We've got to give those fighters more time. Tim applied his puppetry skills to the movie star. But when it came to the voice of Howard the Duck, The voice of Howard was going to be done by Robin Williams. Tim would do the guide voice on set, and then Robin Williams would add his vocal talents later. However, on a visit to the set, Robin Williams had a little fun and did it live. Robin started doing a voice for the duck. It was very much like the voice that I was doing for the duck. Willard Hike, the director, screams out, Rose, you How many times have I told you not to say that out on set while I'm out here directing? The first AD runs over to him and said, that wasn't Tim Rose, that was Robin Williams. Williams turns to me and he says, is that the way things are around here? And I says, well, to be honest with you, he's in a pretty good mood today. And he said, thank you very much. It was very educational and never did the movie. Come the first screening, it was obvious Robin Williams had dodged a bullet. Marvel was looking not at a duck, but at a turkey. It bombed. Earning just $38 million at the box office. By the time you see the lady duck with the bare breasts, you realize that you've entered a new dimension of cinematic experience. It was painful for the studio, and it was painful for Marvel. And to make things especially painful, not long after, DC released a very different movie about a winged character. I'm Batman. In 1989, DC's Batman took in $400 million worldwide. Life's been good to me. I think a lot of the reason that Batman worked was because Batman is a comic book character that everybody knows. Also because of the 1960s TV show. Hold it, Riddler. It had another generation of awareness beyond comic book readers. It was a bitter pill for Stan and Margaret to swallow. And Batman's success did little to entice interest in Marvel's other titles. Stan, he became so discouraged. The man behind the duck learned that firsthand at a comic convention. One of the fans came up to me and said, oh, have you talked to Stan yet? You were his first Marvel character to ever be made into a movie. And I went, oh, yeah, I never really thought about it like that. And it turned out it was just me and Stan Lee standing in this elevator. So I'd say, oh, hi, Stan. I did Howard the Duck. And he just glowered at me and didn't say a word the whole way up in the elevator and then left. Stan Lee was back to square one, needing to find a way to get his most popular characters into the right movie. And following the failure of Howard the Duck, he had no reason to believe he'd ever see that happen. I hope you're getting all this. After being at Marvel for 47 years, through sale after sale of the company, maybe what Stan Lee needed was stability. Unfortunately, that's exactly what he didn't get. When in 1989, a new player entered the Marvel story. Someone who was not a comic book fan. Ron Perlman was one of the richest men in the world, a businessman on the hunt for undervalued companies. Known for Revlon products. And he could tell there was money to be made with Marvel's assets. I guess you'd call Ron Perlman a, a corporate raider. He bought companies and stripped their assets and then sold the husks. In January of 1989, Ron Perlman bought Marvel from New World Entertainment for $82.5 million, a highly consequential deal that would either make or break Marvel. In fact, Perlman might just find a way to do both. 
Ron Perlman had bought Marvel at a good time. Comic book sales were steady, and interest in fantasy figures was on the upswing in Hollywood. Unfortunately, the rights were a little muddy. Even when the mega wealthy Ron Perlman came in and took over Marvel, the rights were still sold very cheaply back then, and the deals were still in place. But this time, the movies got made. Like this 1991 made-for-TV movie of Captain America, produced by Canon Films, which featured a practically asthmatic captain. Carol Coe's adaptation of The Punisher wasn't much better, being, well, punishing to watch. But there was hope on the horizon, as one of Hollywood's most accomplished filmmakers was rumored to be interested in tackling one of Marvel's most important characters. There was a lot of talk about James Cameron creating a Spider-Man movie. Everybody was really like, you know, oh, I want to see that. And it never happened. Hollywood is the only town in the world where hope can kill you. Although Marvel was languishing in Hollywood purgatory, it wasn't quite dead yet as their own Margaret Lesh received an offer that could potentially turn the tide for the beleaguered company. I got offered this job to start a network. But not just any network, an all new Fox Kids network. But Margaret was loyal to Marvel and Stan. Surely she wouldn't consider leaving. Wait a minute, I'm gonna be a buyer. I can buy Marvel shows. And she would be buying them for Fox's Saturday morning kids block. Tired of boring TV? Then take control. Which had the potential of being the perfect home for a Marvel cartoon. The only catch was Margaret was going to have to leave the company she held so dear. And I went to my bosses at Marvel and said, I've got this great opportunity. I'd like to take the job. Well, much to my shock, Ron Perlman wouldn't let me out of my contract. Caught in Ron Perlman's nefarious grip, Margaret hatched a plan to start working at Fox while she wrote out her contract at Marvel. Behind the scenes, we had an office, and at night after I left Marvel, I'd go over there and we'd talk about programming. After months of secret work, Margaret's contract with Marvel expired. And despite Stan's very clear instruction, Don't you ever ask to eat any of my dessert. It appeared Margaret could have her cake and eat stands, too. I'm going to order X-Men first, and then I'm going to order Spider-Man, and then I want to do Silver Surfer. Margaret's spidey sense about X-Men was spot on. The show became a ratings winner. Ironically, it was Margaret leaving the company that saved Marvel and handed them their biggest success yet. The sadness of Wolverine and the unrequited love of Gambit and Rogue, all still very relatable to kids. They took the comic stories and adapted them. They updated them. They made them more contemporary. Things looked to be on the up and up. While Margaret was getting Marvel characters on screen, Ron Perlman, through raising the price of Marvel's comic books, was starting to get their financial books back in order, taking the company public making himself $150 million in the process while tripling Marvel's value. With his empire-building appetite wet, Ron invested in a toy company. Toy Biz, which had a great deal of success selling toys with the Marvel characters. They made this amazing deal. Perlman got 46% of Toy Biz, and Toy Biz got a perpetual exclusive license to make Marvel action figures. It was a deal that triggered a chain of events which years later would come to spell disaster for Perlman's involvement with Marvel. But right now, it spelled disaster for Marvel's aspirations to get its properties on screen. One of the things that this did was make studios even less interested in doing Marvel movies. Because if you couldn't get the rights to the action figures, you were missing out on a big stream of revenue. And this license ended up being a little bit of a, a poison pill. Also hard to swallow was when the movie rights to a little-known comic called Blade were sold for $25,000. Not that Ron's toy biz partners cared about that. Well, initially at least, they had a different priority. How to take Marvel's intellectual property and turn it into toys and make money. But just who were these Toy Biz executives? Toy Biz was run by two guys, one named Avi Arad and Ike Perlmutter. Avi was the idea guy, and Ike was the money guy. And like all successful money men, 
Ike lived in the shadows. You know, there's like three photographs of him that exist in the world. Like he does not want people to know what he looks like or who he is. But as for Ike Perlmutter's chief toy maker, well, Santa Claus, he wasn't. The people who worked for Avi Arad at Marvel were terrified of him. There were all these rumors that he was an ex Mossad agent and he had like an ankle holster for, you know, a gun that he might pull at any time. What Avi would pull regularly was rank. He got directly involved with the Fox Kids cartoons. Well, Avi and I did have some butting of heads a little bit. Avi was a fan of Marvel, but he was first and foremost a toy man. Very smart guy, very driven to support the toys. And therefore, Avi's main concern was that the cartoon characters would look good as toys. When we were developing Spider-Man, he presented us with the new look of Spider-Man for the show. All the drawings were very bulked up. And my reaction, Avi, you know, Spider-Man is a teenage guy. He said, yeah, and he gets these powers and he becomes this. I said, but he doesn't really become that. And so Margaret flexed her muscles and they reached a compromise. And we ended up with a Spider-Man that was bulkier than normal. But in any case. Together, the Spider-Man cartoon and toys were a massive hit for Marvel. But just when it seemed like things were turning around, a fantastic, flawed adaptation threatened to drag them down again. Constantine Films had bought the rights to the Fantastic Four. It could only hurt the brand. Avi Arad's ambitious plans to sell Marvel toys depended on controlling the shows that promoted them. But the puppet masters soon came up against a long-standing Marvel problem. Other people controlled the rights to Marvel's best properties. They sold rights to Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and Captain America. And the Fantastic Four had found its way to Germany with producer Bernd Eichinger and his company, Constantine Films. In the mid-80s, Bernd Eichinger had bought the rights to the Fantastic Four and he was gonna develop them into a major motion picture. Bernd had big plans for the Fantastic Four worth potentially millions. But what he didn't have was time. Eichinger was gonna lose the rights to the Fantastic Four, you know, on December 31st at 11.59 and 59 seconds of 1992, if he didn't start production on the Fantastic Four film. To save his rights, Baron needed to get a major motion picture into production within months. Scale and ambition were sacrificed for speed. There was really only one man in Hollywood who could pull this off the legendary Roger Corman. I'm Roger Corman. Who in a classic Hollywood twist of fate, sold his company New World before it bought Marvel back in the 80s. Bert Eichinger came to me in October and he said, I've got this option on the Fantastic Four, but I have a $33 million budget and I don't have the 33 million, but I lose everything if I don't start the picture before December 31st. Roger had a knack for making cheap movies well. One of his tricks was to hire promising young directors over established veterans. The director that fit the bill for the Fantastic Four was Oli Sasson. We were so excited about the idea of coming out with the first big comic book hero movie in the Marvel Universe. Well, aside from Howard and a few others that don't really count. We had no idea. We were making a movie for a contractual obligation. With only three days before the rights passed back to Marvel, production began. I remember coming out in my full Doom armor and the crew, they were chanting, Doom, Doom, Doom. This is like, we're pirates, you know. We're going to sail the seven seas together. We're going to take no prisoners. With one of Marvel's best-loved comics finally shooting for the big screen, Stan Lee just had to see it with his own eyes. Stan came out to the set. That's the first time I met him. He brought donuts. Sitting around eating pastries was soon a thing of the past. Time was money, and the production had neither. I had to go shoot one scene of the thing running around the streets. They gave us one roll of film, no lights. The casting assistant got into the thing costume, and we pulled up to a traffic light, and he jumps out of the van and runs across an intersection. Why did the thing cross the road? Hey, move it, pal. To get the free lighting for his shot. They had a lot of street lights, so I didn't have to light anything. And for Oli, 
This quickly shone a spotlight on his predicament. I kind of suspected things were going awry because nobody was in a hurry to get the film finished. That was a mystery to Oli, because as far as he knew... Everyone that worked on this film wanted to make something great. Everyone except the film's executive producers. When the production wrapped, the inconceivable happened. Was a whole film was pulled back and shelved and never released. Roger called me and he said, we're not gonna be able to release the Fantastic Four. It's out of our control, it's over. I feel like I just got kicked in the gut. Folks at Fox and legal said, no, you can't release that other film. In terms of kind of who hit the switch to kind of stop this movie, I think the answer is Avi Arad. Probably got his hands on a copy of the movie, watched it and thought, this is a low budget little movie. We're a big company. It could only hurt the brand. Of course, Avi Arad would pay handsomely for the inconvenience, giving Berndt. It was $2 million was the number I heard. Which, of course, flowed down to Roger Corman. He paid me really quite a bit of money because I had a percentage of the profits. But not the crew. We thought, damn, we just killed ourselves making this movie for no money and we have no movie to show. They just took it away. But Avi wasn't content with just shelving the film. Oh, no. He said he burned it or destroyed it because it was such an embarrassment. I think Avi Arad wanted to create an impression of his power over the film and the franchise. But some way, somehow, a copy of the film escaped Avi's grasp. I remember going to a Comic-Con where there were dodgy VHS copies of it knocking around. The film got amazingly good reviews. But Oli wasn't done, and neither was Stan Lee. In the wake of the fallout, striking up an unlikely friendship, and Stan had a plan. He said, well, look, I got this comic book. It hasn't been published, but it's a really cool comic. And he pulls this comic book that they had done years ago. It was called The Femazons. What do you think? Let's go, let's go pitch this. I remember we went to Paramount, we went to Universal, and nobody touched it. That's crazy. Well, at least the Fantastic Four story has a happy ending. 13 years later, Baron Dykinger made the big budget Fantastic Four. You done good, kid. And not just one. Constantine Films would produce three big budget Fantastic Four films for Fox. They all have Constantine Films as the, one of the production entities. But there would be many, many dark days to come before those events took place starting with a major downturn in the comic book industry in the mid-90s, and no Hollywood pitch, no matter how successful, was going to get them out of this one. In the history of Marvel, the darkest days were during the bankruptcy. Off the back of the Fantastic Four debacle, what Marvel needed was a hit. But Ron's seemingly savvy business decisions, like jacking up the prices of his comic books, had come back to haunt him. There was this catastrophic bursting of the bubble. Comic books had become highly collectible, but an oversaturated market had turned that upside down. Comic shops started shuddering. Marvel's core business was under threat. There's even talk of checks bouncing for freelancers, um, which, you know, is obviously a nightmare. Owner Ron Perlman thought he knew the answer. Marvel had to control distribution. By going exclusively with this one distributor called Heroes World. The move backfired. It caused a bunch of other distributors to go out of business and exacerbated the problem. Perlman went searching for cash positive businesses to prop up Marvel, buying the trading company Fleer. At a time when the trading card business was in worse shape than the comic book business. There was nowhere to hide. The company had never been in such dire straits. Marvel was entering a death spiral. Marvel was hemorrhaging money. They were on the verge of filing for bankruptcy. They were literally selling off bits of the company piece by piece. The rumor was they had sold the doors to the office. These Spider-Man doors had been sold on eBay. The way was clear for corporate raiders to sweep in. Notorious investor Carl Icahn could smell blood. You had Ron Perlman fighting Carl Icahn. Icahn bought 40 million of Marvel's debt to wrest control. The boardroom was turning into a bloodbath. In the history of Marvel, the darkest days were during the bankruptcy. To stave off the raid, Perlman filed for bankruptcy. But a second front was opening. Toy Biz, the Marvel toy maker led by Avi Arad, saw a chance to pounce on weakened prey. Toy Biz, Avi Arad, and Ike Perlmutter, kind of a third party. And then a fourth party, the banks. 
the banks were ready to call in their loans. Avi Arad went to the bankers and said, look, Spider-Man is worth millions alone. Avi understood something millions of Marvel fans already knew. The real value of the company was in its characters. Those characters, those ideas, were f worth far more than comic books. Its own superheroes could come to the rescue. Have fun, boys. I'll tell the kingpin you're tied up. Take a look at the intellectual property of Marvel before you make the decision. Avi convinced the banks Toy Biz could save Marvel and trade the company back into the black. A court agreed. The Toy Biz takeover was confirmed. Marvel superheroes are each sold separately from Toy Biz. Marvel IP saved the company. But still needing cash, Marvel would have to sell much more than its signature doors. Because they desperately needed money. So they started selling the movie rights to anybody that would take them. In an almost multiverse type scenario, Marvel once again offloaded discounted film rights, just like they did in the 80s. Part of the problem with the bankruptcy was Marvel lost all leverage with trying to get the amount of money that they really deserved for a lot of these uh, IP characters. The numbers told a sorry tale. Fox took. X-Men for two and a half million dollars. Sony ended up getting Spider-Man for seven million dollars. And Universal ended up getting the Hulk. To some in a panicked boardroom, it was past time to turn a page. They wanted to close the book. There were people that were on the board who just wanted to break it up and who said, look, we've sold Spider-Man, we've sold the X-Men. There's nothing here. We should get what we get and get out. But Marvel still had its impressive stable of characters. They just needed a strategy. And a man by the name of Alan Fine convinced Ike Perlmutter if what they did was as they looked at merchandising and they looked at other ways of making money, it could become this incredibly successful company. And that would lead to making movies. And it did. Because that precarious knife's edge that Avi Arad was straddling finally put a Marvel character on screen in a way that, well, cut through. Blade came out in 1998, almost exactly at the same time that Marvel emerged from bankruptcy. Just as they wrest control of Marvel, they've got a Hollywood hit on their hands. Ironically, it was this Prince of Darkness played by Wesley Snipes that would ultimately make Marvel see the light. Blade proved that a Marvel comic book character could successfully carry a movie. So I think that was a game changer um, as far as Marvel and the way that Marvel thought about movies. Blade's success proved there was light at the end of the tunnel. But to move towards it, the Marvel of old needed to be laid to rest. They said, look, we need to do something radical. We're going to start Marvel over again. To take Marvel to the next level, they'd need to find someone supremely clever, someone that knew comics someone that could unleash the Marvel beast. And it wasn't a big time producer. No, not a member of the cast. Nope, not one of the stuntmen. Ah, there he is, this guy. And that would be Marvel's biggest gamble of all. Kevin was just some dude. He was the guy, the guy getting everybody coffee. And so it's with this coffee boy that our story can truly begin.